thank you for joining. Uh, so we have a um, jam-packed agenda today, um, and uh, Brady just joined, which is great. Um, he'll be uh, doing a demo uh, for us on his recent uh, project. So it'll be uh, a lot of um, inter interesting stuff uh, today, and we have a number of questions as well. Uh, there's not a lot of questions coming from uh, the form, uh, but uh, there'll be some questions that we picked uh, from from Discord channel, so we can we can have some discussions as well. All right. Um, first of all, a quick intro. I think um, most of us, I guess, hopefully know who I am. And if not, I'm um, uh, Vic Patana, uh, part of Social Architect Microsoft, um, and my colleague as well, um, Daniel or DSR. Uh, we call him. Um, you want to introduce yourself quickly? Hey, Daniel. hey everyone. Yeah, I'm a tech strategist in the in the team with um with Vic. Really? Based in NZ, New Zealand, which is why it's the afternoon for me. Great, great. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, so uh first of all, um as usual, um I'll I'll start with a acknowledgement of countries um quickly and then we'll go straight to the content. All right, let me just play this. We would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work throughout Australia, as well as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people viewing this, this event today. We pay our respects to elders, both past, present and emerging, and recognise and celebrate their continuing connection to land, waters and community. Our reverence also extends to all First Nation and Indigenous peoples as well as their ancestral lands. All right, for New Zealand, uh, we acknowledge the Tangata Venua, the indigenous people of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and their enduring connection to the land, waterways and culture. We pay our respects to their ancestors, their current leaders and their future generations. We recognize the rich heritage of the Maori people, and honor the importance of the language, traditions, and customs in shaping the identity of this country. All right, uh, let's move on. We would like to acknowledge. I'll just go straight. Welcome to the APAC slash ANZ Semantic Kernel Public Office Hours. Um, so this is um, just again public, uh, which means that you know anything that we we say will be recorded and will be published uh, to our Semantic Kernel. Uh, YouTube channel, uh, aka LX um, channel, um, and we've run three um, sessions already. Um, so every two weeks uh, we have this session. Uh, for those of you who are uh, quite new um, or new uh, joining the first time, uh, so we we run this every fortnight. Um, so you can download the calendar, um, you know, in the uh, aka.ms um, sk office hours. I'm happy to share that uh, later on in the chat um, with the link uh, to to join obviously if you're joining which means that you pretty much know about it but if you want to share it with your your friends colleagues anyone who's interested please uh, forward them that link so a quick uh, refresher uh, or just a quick update on number of new things that are coming up um, the last two weeks uh, there's number of blog posts as well as videos and also some rebranding as well um, that just recently um, came about. So let me just go straight. Yeah, so first of all, um, uh, Chris uh, Rickman, um, one of the principal engineers um, in the uh, project team, um, just put up a blog, uh, int introduces the integration of semantic memory. Uh, so Chat Copilot now uh, fully integrated uh, with, with uh, semantic memory, uh, whereas in the past um, it uses kind of um, uh, sort of bespoke uh, model, which is kind of uh, different to semantic memory. So but basically now it's uh, calling um, or, or uses that uh, semantic memory SDK um, to uh, perform uh, ingestion, um, indexing of data sets, uh, as well as um, you know basically um, doing the data pipeline uh, overall. So it's uh, the pipeline has been introduced a separate uh, third uh, third party component called memory pipeline, uh, which is uh, available in the in the code. If you um, open up uh, later on, I can I can show you in the in the during the Q and A. Um, 
but you are able to continue and run locally uh, for debugging without this uh, additional service. So you, if you're running it locally, um, you know, for debugging purposes, there's no change in terms of kind of the way you um, do things. Um, and there's some uh, release notes that just been uh, published um, as well um, and implementation. Uh, so how you can deploy that uh, when you deploy to Azure um, or to your preferred cloud provider. Um, the other stuff around uh, the blog posts uh, also mentioned um, Anthony. Anthony is um, best, uh, one of the, I think he's the winner of the plugin hackathon or plugin contests uh, for uh, Semantic Kernel uh, held back, I think, a few months, uh, a few months ago that Alex and the team kind of um, put out there, um, you know, competition or a bit of a contest on uh, who can build the best plugin. And he just uh, posted um, you know, uh, a blog post around uh, harnessing a power of uh, logical bias or logic bias in uh, large language models. Um, and uh, it's interesting uh, sort of touch on how you can um, sort of ingest uh, some sort of uh, sentiment uh, within the the type of, I guess, uh, symbols or the, the type of, um, you know, if you use exclamation mark, if you use question mark and that, that type of thing, it can uh, generate different uh, sort of LLM response um, in there. So definitely um, check that out um, on his uh, on his blog post if you haven't. And on new videos, uh, so I won't be sort of going through all of this um, in, in detail. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much that updating semantic memory in Check Copilot. Uh, it's a company and resource uh, with uh, sort of Chris actually uh, recorded um, as well as um, um, Alex. I think a part of the um, the last office hours, where uh, he provides some update on on that in detail on semantic memory in Check Copilot, um, and uh, you know how how that's being implemented and so on. And SK and Microsoft Graph. Um, it's also a really interesting, well, I'll probably skip that for now. So intro to semantic memory is basically uh, actually before the chat call pilot um, uh, video. Uh, and um, what gentleman's name, but um, he's um, uh, principal, uh, I believe he's principal software engineer as well, that's um, looking after the yeah. semantic memory project. Um, and sorry. It's Devin. 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 Is De Devin. Devin, yeah. It? Yeah, yeah, and uh, he's also posted uh, pretty um, uh, different set of topics around semantic memory. Um, and one of these um, topics uh, is around um, uh, sort of uh, embracing security within semantic memory, uh, where you can use security filters um, within uh, within that. Uh, you know, when you talk about like building um, sort of a large scale. Uh, uh, program or application uh, that needs to, to have different level of security. Say if you need to upload a document and then uh, you want to um, protect that document to be visible to certain users. Um, so he introduced the concept of um, security filter uh, within semantic memory, uh, which is pretty good. Um, and then SK and Microsoft Graph. Um, so this is from Microsoft Graph team, um, basically uh, demonstrating how you can use um, SK. Uh, so it's very interesting. Uh, so external to the to the team, uh, that's that's demonstrating how you can um, uh, build a plugin. Uh, effectively, it's a plugin in Chat Copilot that you can enable, uh, and uh, that uh, will allow you to get the latest changes of. Um, of Microsoft Graph, so they, um, I think he pointed out to RSS feeds, um, and then um, effectively, it's um, you know using that plugin, uh, you can you can find out what are the different changes that are happening within different versions of uh, Microsoft Graph, whenever there is an update. So uh, he demonstrated uh, kind of um, you know certain module uh, that he searches, and then uh, compare it, you know whether this version. Uh, is up to date or whether there's any changes uh, for that particular module, I think was like what SSL and so on. So yeah, it's a um, pretty uh, interesting uh, experimentation. Um, I haven't seen the, the code base for that, um, but if anyone 
know, uh, feel free to share in the chat um, uh, the code base of that. I'm not, I haven't actually seen that uh, yet, but um, it was recorded, so you can definitely uh, review it. And just just to correct, it's Devis Lakato. He is the, okay. not Devon, uh, it's my bad. Uh, he is a principal architect for Semantic Kernel. So all of the design and how everything works comes comes out of out of him. So he's he's worth listening to on some of those those office hours calls because he goes into a great deal of context. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know his Discord uh, uh, handle, um, as as you can see here in the in the. <laughs> In the next in the next slide. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Quark. Um, and this is a rebranding, right? So all of that semantic memory, forget it. Um, ignore that. It's changed now to kernel memory. Um, so that will be uh, uh, I guess re re uh, all updated uh, in the next weeks, um, hopefully. Um, and then um, that will be uh, the official name of semantic memory, which is I think it makes sense to actually name that as kernel memory. So that's how, that's like ATM machines, like semantic kernel kernel memory. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, so, something like that. So interesting. SK kernel memory. Yeah, that's why it's in Discord yet. So yeah. Um. So for those of you who haven't joined Discord, uh, definitely um, uh, join if you uh, if you haven't. Um, there's a lot of great discussions in there, um, and there's different channels as well uh, where you can ask specific questions and plugins on on uh, planners, um, you know, the semantic memory or kernel memory now. Uh, so that's pretty much um, very, very uh, rich uh, discussions there. All right, uh, without further ado, I might just um, hand it over um, to a uh, um, colleague, uh, my honor to, to present, <laughs> um, uh, Brady. Uh, where he's uh, recently uh, built uh, a project or uh, created a uh, an application called TimeC GPT. Um, I'll let him kind of just define or, or sort of show and, and and showcase what it is. Um, but it it looks really interesting uh, from just looking at the screenshot and so on, um, where it gets uh, data from various sources and then use semantic kernel to summarize all that and present it to you in this um, experience, uh, which is really interesting given that, you know, a lot of it usually um, chat experience and this is uh, something different. So I'll let you uh, share your screen if you want. Awesome. I'm ready. Thank you, Vic. Uh, yeah, so timesheet EPT is a little project I've been working on when I have spare time. And basically, the problem it's solving is when I do my timesheets, I have to go through all the emails I've sent for a day, all the all the appointments I had in my calendar, and then I need to sort of summarize that into a nice timesheet, into nice notes for the timesheet app. And it takes a while. So I, I built this timesheet GPT. So you give it a date. And I'm going to do last Monday because that's the day that I found that there's no um, there's no secret emails. There's nothing there's nothing to hide on Monday. And you can see the additional prompts field here. Now this I haven't found much many use cases for this, but it's kind of just lets you if you want to ignore something, you can say ignore emails about a certain topic. And additional notes. If you've taken notes for your day somewhere, you can just dump them in there. Anyway, so we can see it's got it's gone to a gra Microsoft graph and it's grabbed all the emails I sent on Monday and every meeting that I had. And you can see some of them are nine hours. Now that means it's a it's a booking. So it's like yeah, that was my focus for the day. Sometimes that would be a client booking. And we can see it figured that out and it's recognized I did the tech news, I took two hours, and then it's got all my other meetings there and emails. You can see it's picked different emojis for them to sort of indicate what's an email, what's a meeting. Pretty cool. Anyway, this is pretty nice. I can just hit copy, then I can go paste that into my timesheet app. And yeah, so that's that's the basic functionality of it. It's very basic and it was super easy to build. So I might jump over to the code. 
Yeah, I really so like that. Just, um, you mentioned there's no use case, but I can see this. You know, a few people are mentioning that it's uh, pretty good, especially if you're in sort of consulting and so on. So it's great to, to be able to to do that. Now, now you got to write one for like performance reviews, like at the end of every year, just like go through and like find <laughs> all the good stuff you did. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, all this data is available. We just need to pull it out and do the right thing with it. Yeah. Hey, yeah, um, Brady, so, so the, the one thing about the emails there, like it, it just grabs yeah. the subjects, right? It's not just it's the subject. Whole email. Right. Yeah. All right, yeah. cool. And the yeah. meetings, like does that look at your calendar? So, yeah, it's looking at the calendar and it's getting mm -hmm. the meeting subject and the length. I, I realize the length is pretty important to indicate like what it was. Anyway, it's a Blazor server app, and I did Blazor server because I know Blazor server is very quick to build. Um, I'm not sure if it's the right tech for this, but it's working pretty well so far. Anyway, it's using it. Mudblazor, so this is the component. Oh, okay, I wondered about the the component library you were using. It looked like Mudblazor. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, nice. we'll skip to the interesting stuff. So generate timesheet. This is what happens when you click that generate button. We use this service here and we pass it everything. We pass it the date, so today's date, and any notes and any extra prompts. And then I'll F12 on that. And I'm grabbing the graph service client. Now, I saw that video that Vic showed earlier where it was, I saw the thumbnail or something about graph and semantic kernel. So maybe there's a better way to do this, but I'm just using the graph API, how, we, how you would normally use it. And then I've got a I've got a little abstraction of that to get some emails and the meetings, and then I take all that and then pass it to my AI service, which is just semantic kernel. And I set up all the set up the builder. I use OpenAI, set up the kernel, and then I generate it and. I've passing it in a prompt and the prompt configs and add all the variables and then it just executes that and gives me a nice result. So this was my first semantic kernel thing. I've there's probably things to improve, so I'd love to hear it if there is. Anyway, what I wanted to show you is how I structured my prompts. Right now it's sort of horizontal slices. I've got the prompt templates. And that's in one class. And I've got two prompts in there. One's not being used. But I was sort of trying to figure out the best way to do this and how how it would scale. And I, I'm not in love with this option, but this is what I'm doing right now. So there's the prompt templates, and that's got the prompt in it with a. So I'm still doing the like the semantic kernel prompt language. But I'm just I'm just hitting that in a function because it's ugly. And then I've made constants for all the variables, so there's no magic strings being used. And then the prompt configs, that's another file, another class, and I've got two configs in there. Yeah. Awesome. Anyway, that's that's. The, that's the like the initial scope of what I wanted to build. And then on the weekend, I was playing around with some cool stuff. If I've got time, Vic, I'd love to show that. Yeah, sure. Just a quick question on this. Um, yeah. Just around the kind of authentication, because I can see that you're um, grabbing or fetching data from Microsoft Graph. Um, yeah. So Where is that was the just... question? Just the standard uh, bearer token that you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So use for that, yeah. Obviously, um, you don't have to show that here, but. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, your bearer token, yeah. You sign in on the client, and it just passes. Well, it's a Blazor server app, so your client is your server. So, yeah. I don't. I'm not passing any tokens around. That's okay. Yeah, that was the easiest way I could think of doing it. I couldn't figure out. I would love it if the API was separate, mm -hmm. so I could build like integrate this like the timesheet gpt service into timesheeting apps mm -hmm. so i should make that change i've got the project here it's just empty right now <laughs> yeah 
to is this blazer blazer seven or blazer eight 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 okay yeah. so waiting for waiting for the the final release of that um hey th this is awesome just uh couple of questions have you thought of using or did you consider using um because you've got an inline um skill function there right yeah have you yeah. considered moving that out into an imports um then you can use the visual studio extension for semantic kernel and sort of evaluate the prompt you know the evaluate the functions outside is that something sort of on the roadmap you create a skills like i've got to stop using the term skills a functions Function. library yeah. plugins library yeah Re rebranding I, again <laughs> i yeah i haven't i haven't investigated it much moving that but i have i was playing around that was the next thing i was going to show so i might jump into that i'm going to go to slash chat and this is a, another page I built, and it's very bare bones. So I'm going to copy a prompt I prepared earlier. And it says, show me the email subjects for the 16th of October. And that'll have a think. And so what's that, what that is doing is it's using this function here. No, up, it's using this one. and. This was what I was playing around with on the weekend. It's, I don't know if I've done it right, but it's pretty cool. So I've got a plugins class and there's just a few very simple plugins, get email body from ID, and then a few other ones to get various data. And you can see if we, oh, it's brought me here. Cool. I'll just jump back. You can see that these functions are being used anywhere in the code. So they're only being used by the the planner when it decides to use them. So I'll jump back and I can see that's done. So I'm going to continue that and get rid of that. And yeah, so it's gone and got me all the same data, but I could do it in a natural language way. Nice. So that's creating a plan using the function, yep. the graph function uh, that you've created, which is a, which is a um, native function, right? It's not a semantic function, it's a native function. Is that, that's correct? That your yep. graph plugin, and then going and calling. Cool, sweet, now it works. Yeah. You've found it, have you tried it with GPT-3.5 and GPT-4? It looks like you're using, you've tried both, yep. cheap mode and yep. cheap mode. <laughs> so and I've got cheap mode and expensive mode. <laughs> and I found expensive mode is miles better. Yeah, so. you because obviously the newer version of SK uses um, the functions uh, attributes of the the newer GPT models. Are you using that version? Have you found a difference between or a reliability? Did you uh, you, you talked about doing this this weekend? So I'm assuming. Mm. Um, you're using. You probably didn't use the older one where. It didn't no. use didn't use that extent didn't use that attributes function the functions attribute of the the API call. Yeah, yeah, I never tried the old one, but I have found this pretty reliable. It always figures out like it always makes a good plan, figures out what it needs to do, using the functions to achieve the goal. Yep, uh, haven't had any issues with it getting confused. I there is, this one was annoyed me for a bit. I had to create it. It doesn't know what day it is. I had to tell yep. it. I had to make this to explain what day it is, so it could. I think go find that. Just out of interest, I think in the semantic kernel, there's a. It, it comes with a, a number of built-in. Mm, there could be functions. Yeah. I think. I probably. It's probably a better way of doing it. Maybe I can import. Well, it's, the same, it's done the same way. I think. They, I think they can't. I can't remember off the top of my head, but in the SK. Uh, Vic, have you got the GitHub? repo for SK there, they've got a, 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 a set of sort of helpful native functions that you can sort of import in just to help you things like get yeah. date, you know, what's today's date? Yeah, out of, out of the box plugins or something, they call it, I don't know, it's, um, it's available in uh, SK, yeah, in the SK um, uh, repo, um, and you can import them, yeah, effectively you can just import them and, and use that um, uh, for your application, I think I think it's when it says out of the box, you have to have to actually import it. It's not like right, you know, yeah, you yeah. 
<laughs> you actually uh, run the the kernel and then it has everything in there, but you just have to import that. Yeah. And do you, using stepwise, did you try with sequential? Did you have any different? Uh, briefly, uh, I did, and, and I found it didn't perform very well. Okay, it's good to know. Yeah. So, so stepwise yeah. works works well. The yeah, other thing in there is cool. is the API key. Um, you're passing an API key. There's those that completion service does support um, token auth as well. So you can actually go and create a service principle on your um, on your Azure OpenAI service if you're using it. Uh, this is using OpenAI, isn't it? Yes. In which right. case you can't, but you can with Azure OpenAI. You can add a, a yep. um, an auth token. Yeah, cool. Nice. Yeah, I'm sure there's lots of lots of other improvements I can make as well. Um, yeah, so that's yeah. I recorded I your improvements here from awesome. uh, DSR for you, Brady. So you know, right. I'll make a <laughs> full backlog to work on it after this. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so this is an open source repo. If you guys have any other ideas, go make an issue. Um, that was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So cool. I send the cool. um yeah, I send the uh, the repo link as well. Oh yeah, I'll do that. So. And showing off already. Blazor 8. I mean, come on. This is this is <laughs> this is all the Leading great, edge. all the cool yeah. stuff. Yeah. Have you deployed uh, it to Azure yet, Brady? I think we worked on that as well, didn't we? Yeah. So it is live. There's a link here in the repo. All this stuff I've did on the weekend is still in a PR. Luke had a few complaints about it, but I'll get through them. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's live. So you can go use it. Try it out. It'll just sign you in and, um, to Microsoft account. Yeah. yeah, so any Microsoft account will work, yeah? Oh, I might have to check that. I'm pretty sure we fixed the app registration so it does let anyone in, but mm. I haven't tried it with a personal account. Yeah. All right, if it doesn't work today, it'll, it'll work tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, I was going to ask, um, what about um, like getting it like stuff like... um. Like copilot recaps and stuff, like to get information about meetings. Yeah, you could you could definitely get it to look at transcripts and stuff for meetings. You know, would that would that any, add any would that any, add any value to your um to the, to the functionality or de determining depends, what your depends how yeah. detailed you want your timesheets, I guess. Like how much for me, I found the subject is more than enough most of the time. Yeah. 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 It proved it probably proved that I was just talking rubbish the whole way through the meeting. <laughs> no one has to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, the biggest takeaway I got from building this is that it's super quick to spin this stuff up, get it working. Um, so even like some of this stuff, you might say, "Oh, you can. You don't have to write. You don't have to use AI for that. You can. You can um, do this stuff without AI." And that's probably true, but like the speed I could get this working is it's it's crazy. Yeah. So if you're prototyping something, if you're trying to get something working quickly, definitely go just use AI, even if it's probably not the most optimized use case for it. Yeah. And like the, the, the possible extensions, like you like throw like Wolfram or something in the mix and just like get it to do like traveling yeah, right. and like like yeah. routing to see that was the, the that was the worst route you went to you took to go and visit all those customers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. That's it for me. Thanks, guys. Thanks, bro. Fantastic. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Reddy. Um, first demo of APAC and NZ. Uh, it's my kind of office hours, so uh, brilliant. Um, really love that. I think uh, hopefully we get more demos and people are volunteering and wanting to to showcase their, their cool stuff that they're building, um, more more than welcome to do that. So I'll share um, how you can do that. Um, just need to fill in a form and then we can schedule that uh, in upcoming office hours. Thank you, Reddy and, and the team, uh, Will and everyone in the SSW uh, team. So appreciate it. OK, um, so let's move on to uh, Q&A. Uh, so let me just uh, capture a few questions that um, came up in our form. So I just see here. Cool. All right. Um, so first, first question of the 
the list. So we'll make sure this is the first slide of the Q&A. So does anyone have an open source GitHub Jira or Git GitLab plugin to share in order to better understand the subtleties of implementing plugins with semantic kernel? Um, we do have, I'm not sure if Sarah's online, but uh, this question from Discord. Uh, we do have some um, out of the box, not really out of the box, but sample implementation of uh, GitHub um, plugin as well as Jira plugin within chat copilot. Uh, so you can check that out. Um, we just sh uh, share that in the in the chat as well. Uh, kind of the two plugins that you can uh, you can take a look at. Um, yeah, like, GitLab. Like, I don't know if anyone know if there's any existing GitLab plugin um, available. The, the the GitHub um plugin that that just does pull requests, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was asking yeah. all these questions, and it goes, oh, I don't, I can't answer that. I can't. Yes, yeah. So, but yeah, it, it's a yes, a simple implementation to show you how what's possible. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, you can change that. Um, at least all the skeleton is there. Um, mm. building that plugin. Uh, just a matter of changing the um the different open API parameters and so on. Um. It, should shouldn't be hard to flip that to to use the GitLab APIs. Yeah, yeah, it should be. Yeah, I'm just wondering if anyone in the community know if there's any existing GitLab, please uh, shout. All right. Uh, next question. This is probably interesting, and DSR might have uh, one or one thing or two um, opinion on on this. Um, so I have a C# -sharp web API application that calls OpenAI. I like to know the steps to implement a semantic kernel in my web app. So we just shown that demo. <laughs> um, you know, Brady just did a demo on that, um, a brilliant demo on how you can uh, kind of build um, semantic kernel and and in integrate it to to your web app. Um, this one specifically call out OpenAI or you know any LLM really. Um, that's kind of the the goal of the project is to make it um, uh, agnostic. Um, so you can you can integrate uh, the kernel supports um, OpenAI, Azure OpenAI, uh, I think also Llama as well, um, and they're growing lists of uh, LLMs. Uh, but in terms of kind of the steps uh, to implement that, um, it's probably not a semantic kernel question. So really more around your application architecture, um, how you would uh, deploy uh, your application or build your application. Um, in Chat Copilot, probably the um, a really good reference application where you can um, see how semantic kernels are implemented um, and how kind of the different parts of the application interact. Um, so there's there's a model uh, where you can uh, deploy semantic kernel if you do locally uh, local debugging. Uh, there's not, uh, I guess, uh, a lot of I guess uh, external services that you have to worry about. It's all kind of within um, within the process, we call it in-process um, architecture. Whereas if you deploy it uh, as a uh, distributed um, architecture, where you can actually run Chat Copilot as a service, um, and uh, that means that you can call, um, you know, like a endpoint uh, for you to call out from your application. So yeah, so that's uh, there's a lot of different known patterns out there. Um, you know, just standard kind of application pattern. Uh, one thing to to think about is um, how you would, um, I guess, uh, deal with you know identity. How you would uh, authenticate that? How do you deal with security? Uh, that type of thing. So that's uh, a lot of considerations there. Any thoughts from anyone? Um, maybe. Yes, yeah, I might want to share yeah, so something. Hey, let, let, uh, ask Brady, right? <laughs> you, you, <laughs> but uh, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like this would be a standard sort of at the moment you've built your your the SK kernel, which is the the core of everything that happens in SK. You've built that into your into your Blazor app as a part of that Blazor app. What you might you know, and you talked about in future, you'd move that potentially out into an API, and you would have the the kernel object in that standalone API that could scale and, you know, you could potentially use queues and other sorts of ways to interact with it. Is that, Brady, then maybe this is a bit of a question for you. At What happens at scale when you, 
you know, how does your application behave as everyone on this call tells all of their friends who deal with all the timesheets and they all jump on and they go, I need to, I need to do this. The the question is always, hey, do I start a new kernel object every every request? What do I do? Now I know that the team is the semantic kernel team intends the for the kernel to be super lightweight, very, very fast to start up. So it should instantiate a new kernel on every every request. What's your how what's your yeah. approach been? What's your experience been? So my approach has been the easiest one, <laughs> which is to spin it up every time. Um, and that's because I copy the code from the the Microsoft Docs, but I have been thinking about how to create the kernel object just the once for the lifetime of the app, or maybe the lifetime of the user. I don't know. I, haven't, I need to put more thought into it, but mm -hmm. there's a few different ways you could go, and I I think it makes sense for those functions to be, just be created once. Well, I, yeah, yeah. I, I thought that as well, but if we go, having a listen to some of the recent uh, office hours calls actually Davis and, and the team do they discuss that in a number of different calls and that they've sort of gone the hey we intended or at least planned for you to be able to stand up the create the kernel on every request and so they've designed it with that really right. high speed involved and potentially even multiple kernels per, per request so there's a lot of discussion about a kernel mm you a plugin actually creating its own kernel so perhaps what you might have a semantic plugin that does needs to do its own ai work and own you know do a whole lot of other stuff you would actually potentially create a kernel that plugin would create its own kernel um so yeah you're actually on the right you've you've been on the right track it does sound like that is where the team has there's not one hard rule but they do certainly talk about the their intent behind this as kernel per request you know you you'd add that to your you know to your web api pipeline as a um as a you know as a dynamic service um yeah yeah, yeah. i think i think you just need to, to balance kind of the uh, kind of the requirements on you know having having it up and running um and the number of requests that you that you're making um, that serverless model uh, versus um, kind of the in-process model um, kind of uh, intrigued um, us a little bit on how the different deployment and the way they currently um, run uh, for chatbot call it the local debugging experience is in process so that you know that it's actually going to be just for a period of time you don't actually debug forever uh, whereas uh, the distributed model by default it uses um, uh, kind of a um, uh, an API that an a API endpoint uh, that uh, you can fire anytime, um, and then it will just uh, instantiate new kernel object, uh, which is um, a different uh, sort of implementation model. But that's interesting that the reference app is actually uh, built that way. Um, so yeah, in the app setting.json, you probably see that um, the ingestion pipeline uh, where you can actually see the two or oh, if not three uh, deployment modes um, in there. Yeah, there's an, there's an issue somewhere. I'm just trying to find it, but I can't find it. But it's around um, like HTTP connections and stuff. So they were this, it's like saying that they, they're trying to like refine the use of um, yeah, and initially they're, they're being really um, careful around HTTP connections because they just, they just didn't want to like uh, just blow that out. So there's, they're doing a lot of work in there. And then and I guess the, the whole idea of the semantic memory, the, like, you know, the, the, you know, like as, as DSR said, like the, around the queues and, and just trying to make everything as scalable as possible. It's there, I guess they're, they're, you can see that focus throughout the, throughout the whole um, ecosystem. Yeah, definitely worth listening. If you, if you can go back a couple of, I think it was last week and the week before that was discussed, or the question came up around, uh, and, around whether you should use a scoped service or a, um, uh, or not. And I think it was the the design was scoped service. So that so all the effort is to make put into making sure the kernel is as fast to start up as possible. Um, but 
yeah, I, I don't think there was a, a hard rule either. It, so it's not like they were saying, hey, you shouldn't do this. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, That's I think what I, you find out. I think that there's an issue. I'm tr really trying to quickly find it, but it's there's there's one around um, the when it's going through when it's going through your, your, your chat history and doing and doing the embedding. There's 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 a there's some sl like slowness and the and the response to the devs was yeah, around that yeah. So they're going to ha take care of all the um, you know reuse you know the reuse of HTTP connections and stuff. So I guess you don't have to worry about it. you can just yeah spin up one. Hey, anyone yeah. else on the call? Just quickly, Jim, I don't know if I saw Jim on the call before. Jim, I know you've built using SK. What do you guys do? If you want to, if you can come off mute or if you want to chat. Oh, what? Uh, the web API integration? Yeah. What did you, did you guys end up creating a kernel per request or how did you approach it? Um, we are currently in the POC using a Singleton because it's just running on gotcha. an individual's machine. Uh, the plan is to do it per request and serialize and deserialize the conversation. Okay. That's possibly one thing we're looking at, but we're also probably going to experiment, try and oh. find what the best solution is. It would be really interesting for a future office hours, I reckon, a, a topic to hear here because I think a lot of it is. You know, going to be use case based, right? And if you're if you're adding fifty things to the kernel and doing a whole lot of imports and all sorts of stuff, maybe that more, makes more sense to keep it as a singleton. Yeah, I think you've got you've got the singleton, and then you've got the chat completion options. There's two separate things, so you could have mm -hmm. the all of the kernel as the you know as the singleton, and the you know all of the chats serialized and deserialized if you're maintaining that conversation that's the next thing to figure out on this PSC we're working on so oh, wow okay look forward um, to hearing about it. happy to demo that at some point yeah please um yeah uh if you haven't already i'll i'll share the um uh the form um so that we can uh, get you in line for the next uh, office hours if you can jim yep i've got that I got that filled in, so that should be good. Really? Thank you. Appreciate awesome. it. All righty. Uh, thanks for that. Great discussions. Um, this one here is a bit uh, implementation specific, and this is something that I randomly sort of grab from Discord because uh, people don't answer or haven't haven't answered them. Um, and this is probably people that um, in the in the call might might know. Um, I actually don't know the answer for this. It seems to be a little bit of a um, configuration on your um, mailbox permission. Um, so basically, you know, this, um, this person trying to use Microsoft Grab plugin in the Copilot, chat Copilot, I'm assuming, uh, after click yes, um, or particular step related to emails, I get that error. Um, he's hosting the app in Azure and using Azure AD. Um, can anyone point in the right direction? So seems to me like a permission thing in the mailbox. Um, but if anyone has any, um, I guess, more specific uh, pointers, um, let us know. I think I know the answer. <laughs> um, so I've had this, I've had this uh, as well. And it, like originally it was because I was using a, um, um, I had a user that didn't actually have a Microsoft 365 like license, so so it was like so that that was the first thing. But then the second thing was that um, there seems to be an issue when if you um, if you it, with guest users um, with so the um, so if you if you if you've invited a guest user into the tenant that you're using, um, then you've got to make sure um, you're going to I think you've got to make sure you're that your um that your app registrations are actually multi-tenant. If you want to uh, if you want to be able to use them now, that that's uh, that's unconfirmed. That's what I said. I think I know. So I'm trying to yeah. I got a thumbs up. Uh, maybe I'll take that as a win. But yeah, I think yeah, I think it's just because all in mind. I've just got this kind of this uh, re my kind of reference implementation. So I just have a you know, I have a, a tenant which I've just invited as guest users in. So I'm yeah now going to sort out that um. Switch into a multi-tenant and 
then that's um i still have to kind of recreate them because it's a bit of a bugger to convert them from single to multi you've got to go and do a whole lot of stuff in the manifest if you do yeah yeah and and i think thanks thanks for that simon uh look just uh paste in a link as well potentially a few things to troubleshoot in there so fantastic so i guess we won't spend a lot of time on that given that uh, it's a little bit outside of sk <laughs> sort of uh environmental thing um so the next question that we that we have here um pretty interesting name um not sure if this is the right place but i've kind of have a new question is there any plugin that exists beyond the just beyond just the bing search one that would let me pass a web page or hit up an http uh, like someone's github page uh, i'm looking to add extra quick contacts uh, like a blog or code repo to improve my tech interview coaching so i guess that's for personal reason um yeah so this is uh th there's some examples on uh i think that uh, matthew uh, did on uh, wiki uh, wikipedia um sort of where you can actually uh, create a, a netty function uh and call uh an http uh, endpoint it will return uh response uh from that um and and you can then perform any you know with that's a great thing about llm is that you can actually filter all the garbage and the data that you've got um, out of you know, HTML, um, and then it will be able to pass uh, that in a, in a natural language. Um, the I think if you're looking for that type of uh, examples, you can always change that to a different endpoint or different um, sort of HTTP. Um, but if you're talking about kind of the uh, needing some sort of um, uh, authentication, that's uh, probably a different uh, different scenario. Um, someone also answered, um, again, we need to actually expand this scenario, understand what you're trying to do. Um, but there is a feature called kernel memory uh, where you can run uh, as a as a web service or embedded in your uh, .NET app uh, if you're using .NET. Um, and it has APIs, two APIs, um, they're called import web page. Um, and ask. Um, so, so the input import web page uh, downloads uh, the the page from uh, URL, and then saves the data in memory. Um, and the memory can be, you know, any any supported databases, you know, QDRAN, any vector uh, vector database, or even file system. Um, second API. Uh, then able to ask the questions and then get answers grounded based on that. Um, so you can you can do that um, within uh, within the kernel memory. So there's uh, APIs that are already uh, pre-built in there. But also there's uh, another uh, basically that that video where uh, Matthew you know basically guided us on how you create plugins and basically call um, uh, uh, HTTP um, endpoint. So yeah, probably need to have a bit more context on this to, to understand more. I was just going to say the um, I'm pretty sure last time I looked at the, the kernel memory, they the like there's a real simple version where you just kind of instead of a read it, like if you have, if you put a if you have to submit a PDF, it is obviously going to parse the PDF. But if you go and submit a .URL, it, it will actually go and use that stuff and go and rip that page and and yeah. Um, create embeddings and so you can um, talk to that or you could just go and use something like like there's heaps of like projects on like github with like scrapey and stuff which are really really powerful that you could just go and yeah i've got i've gone for demos just just pointed at someone's website and just rip their entire website and throw it in your embeddings and then so they can go and talk to their website yeah right. but the the dot url one in semantic memory from from example for from um from memory, I'm pretty sure it just does one page. It doesn't crawl. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. And also Jim mentioned um, use uh, browser automation like Playwright uh, to do that. So it's great. Thank you. Um, next question. Uh, as a dev, understanding the the last question, actually. Um, it's probably a bit a bit more sort of going back a little bit and and sort of uh in terms of advance and, and dial down a little bit uh so as a dev understanding the sk as a framework of code um is great uh, but i'm seeing that prom engineering is entirely new domain 
uh, what books are you all, uh, I guess, from uh, US here, uh, reading or recommend um, a read? Any recommendations from anyone? <laughs> I think this is open, open slather. Any any book recommendation? I guess uh, with the fact that things are changing every day, um, probably books uh, may not be, I guess, the best source. But you know, there will be certain things um, that that will not change. Um, maybe, uh, but keen to to hear from anyone here. So I don't I don't have any favorite book, uh, but I do have some links um, that books on child psychology. <laughs> <laughs> um, I found Lillian Wang, who's a she she's a data scientist from OpenAI, has written a lot of good. She's got her own personal blog, written a lot of really deep thinking on prompt engineering and the advanced, more advanced techniques. Um, there's lots of people writing about it, right? But I don't. I've not seen a book. And if you ask GPT, ask one of the GPT models for their guidance on prompt engineering, you get pretty basic stuff. The other thing I also lean towards is um, uh, the Salace laws. You know, Sam Salace is one of the Microsoft CTOs in the office of the CTO. He he's written a law set of ten laws that sort of generally apply across, um, or nine laws actually um, that, that apply across these large language models, and it's good. It's a good place to start but some really you know some really cool stuff around you know is being done around things like internal critique and techniques where we get the model to critique its own results and those sorts of techniques seem to be be growing fast in in how they can apply and how we can use them to get better outputs out of a lesser model but i've yeah i i just lean on lillian wang and people like that yeah, it's very hard to um to actually pronounce that name. Still, I say laws. Um, but yeah, <laughs> there's there's nine of them, and I just shared the link in there. So um, I think John posted that. John made a um, as well. Great stuff. Um, yeah, if anyone have uh, if anyone has any uh, suggestions on books or reading materials, videos, etc., please feel free to. Uh, put in the chat or put in Discord as well. Alrighty, uh, cool. So that is it as far as the number of questions. Um, I keep uh, the last one as open discussion. If anyone wants to uh, share or ask any questions um, and want to talk about anything related to Semantic Kernel, uh, please uh, uh, unmute yourself or Tap in the chat window and then we can we can talk about that. No one's got anything I've got one. Is, is there anyone uh, with the um like I'm yeah I'm de deploying all my stuff um through you know through the you know, the pipelines that were in the in the chat copilot and every, and everything's great. I've just got some deployments where where the web searcher like won't work. And it was like, and it's giving me like 401s and, and, it, and, and it's like the, the key, like, the, yeah, cause it's basically, there's like a key with the Bing AP or the Bing resource. And you've you know, got to put that in a, an, an app setting in the, um, in the Azure function. And I've got like, got like one, one that will, that works fine. And the other one just keeps, keeps throwing 401s and the key's right. And I, I can't figure it out. Has anyone seen hit that and know what the hell's going on? Uh, yeah, I had I had a similar issue there a while ago. Uh, I'm using the Bing Search plugin. Uh, that's it, part of Copilot. Hmm. Simon, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, well, yeah, the the web searcher. Um, yeah. As a, as a function calling the Bing resource. Yeah. Yeah, I did I did that um, a while back, and this is something that um, I did demo last week uh, using sort of web search function. Um, and this, I'm not sure what. Uh, I guess you were referring to just kind of the issue, but I had some issues uh, binding the, um, I guess the the startup in the in the project to uh, to basically um, uh, retrieve data from the app settings or JSON. 
Um, so in this case, let me see if, if it does work. But uh, last time I, I did uh, test it out, you know, um, and it works. Uh, spot news, uh, number of results, whatever, and then execute. Um, there you go. Yeah, it, it, it works. Um, so effectively, it returns that uh, spot yep. uh, thing. And then uh, from your copilot, uh, you go and just go add your plugin uh, in here and then add the plugin, right? Just just normal there uh, and then enable it. Um, and hopefully it should just be all right. Let me just see if I can copy the actual um, uh, prompt, but you can just, you know, come up with something. Um, tell me about the latest news on spores in Australia and summarize the result. So this is just my, my favorite what's the weather tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, so that should uh, go and go with the plan. Um, so just the web and then return and summarize the results from Bing search. Um, it actually picks the um, the outputs and then bind it into the input straight away. Uh, which looks all right. Um, and user sequential, by the way, this one's not using stepwise. And there you go. So that's um, kind of the, uh, basically that's the result. And let's see if I can share the code in here. Um, I'll, I'll plan to share this as well, um, hopefully soon. Um, so in here where you can uh you can see that it's just uh, a native zoom, function zoom in zoom in a bit Sorry. Vic. thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you thank it's you. very tiny yeah. oh um and this one doesn't seem to zoom there you go that's better hopefully uh yeah so basically it's just a, a native function uh in here um and I do have a native function as well uh, called Bing Search. Um, and it's basically based on the check pilot uh, code, and they already have that uh, in place. Um, but I guess the main changes that I did, and I'm not showing you the uh, my keys, uh, but certainly in the host.json, uh, sort of local settings.json, so I'm just going to open the example. Um, you need the Bing API key in here, and I had some issues trying to retrieve this value um, and to be loaded into the program, um, into the application. Um, so that's that was one issue that I had. Um, and then I just did um, debug it and just uh, have a look at uh, when you run this bing.search.cs. Uh, there's, um, as you go through and make the API call, it doesn't have the key um, in there, so it returns that 401. Or whatever that um, thing um, that you had there. So this, I think, this is the Bing API key to so that one there. Yeah, um, maybe um, I'll, I'll send it over you and and see if that if you can sort of do a comparison, maybe. Um, yeah, well, m mine's heaps simpler. It's like if I if I go if I um really really quickly. Sure. Like if I. I go into like this this sweat. Let me go grab that key, right? And then I go and, and check that. <laughs> yeah, uh, it'll it'll be changed straight straight afterwards. Right? <laughs> um, so I go authorize that. All right, so we're authorized. And then, unless I'm just not understanding something, but yeah, like um, yeah, uh, that's the weather. Tomorrow, uh, unauthorized, and that's, that's 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 the right key. Yeah, yeah, that's that's um, if you if you do a um, debugging um, in there and see whether they. The API key is being passed in, so I had an issue where the config isn't loaded um, or wasn't loaded. Where's um, CMO? Yeah, if you see the log, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm just concerned that we just hit one. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, but um, we'll be able to <laughs> we'll be able to get back to to that and then 
uh, we can we can discuss it offline. Okay. Awesome. All right. Um, any uh, questions from anyone um, that you'd like to to share before uh, we finish the call? Any last minute thing? Perfect. No worries. Uh, so I did promise. Um, just want to share quickly the um, uh, the form where you can actually um, uh, submit your questions, or if you want to demo anything, um, want to showcase. Um, Jim, thank you for for doing that. Uh, so just make sure that you select uh, the right region, um, and then I'll filter that. I usually check it every Monday, um, and then uh, go through all the questions, and then we'll be featuring those questions as well as demos um, in that. Um, in that session, uh, in that week. So, yeah. Thank you again very much and uh, looking forward to the next session. Um, please uh, keep the feedback coming as well as uh, Discord if you haven't joined already. Thanks, everyone. It's awesome. Thank you all. Thanks, all. Cool. Thanks. See ya.